The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went into a region of Centuria Philippi and asked his disciples, who do, you, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the neither world shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about faith, it's such a great gift that we receive. It's something that the Lord blesses us with. And we know we receive the gift of our faith in baptism. That was the moment that we received the gift of our Catholic faith. And so when we received the gift of that faith, we became part of this family called church. Such a great grace that we are a family. We say church family. And it's so true. That is reality that we acknowledge and we experience every time we come here together to worship God as brothers and sisters in Christ. I remember a moment in time when I didn't feel like I was part of the church. It was a time when I wasn't coming closer to Christ. But the Holy Spirit revealed to me that I needed to, to come back to Christ through Our Lady. And so when I made my consecration to Jesus through Mary by St. Louis de Montfort, it took me on a journey. The Holy Spirit led me back to Christ through Our Lady. And it was 33 days of preparation. During those 33 days, I would read passages of the scripture to empty myself from the spirit of the world. I read about who Our Lady is in the role of the church, who Our Lord is in the role as head of the church, and what my role was in relation to our Lord and Our Lady. And I remember I made my first sincere confession. Beforehand, I never understood what is the meaning of confession. I remember as a kid, I would go to confession in school, and they would kind of just make me do this, but I didn't understand what it was. I didn't grasp the, this mystery in this sacrament. But the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, He gave me light. As a priest, and all priests, we receive the authority, the keys, to be able to give absolution, the forgiveness of sins. And when we go to confession, what do we see? You see a priest. 
But with eyes of faith, we see Christ. Yes. With eyes of faith, we see our Lord present in the priest. And that grace was given to me. And so I confess my sins, not to a priest, but to Christ that's present in the priest. You know, last Sunday I talked about how each sacrament has a visible aspect and an invisible aspect. Why? Because we're human. We're not angels. We're not spirits. So when we go to confession, we acknowledge the authority of Christ that each priest receives. And what does that authority come from? The authority came from me when I was ordained by Archbishop Sharpu. And who ordained him? Another bishop. And when you go all the way back, where does it go back to? The Christ. 2,000 years. Our Lord laid his hands upon his apostles, upon Peter and all of his apostles, and he gave them authority to celebrate the sacrament of confession. You know, we have great faith in a natural way in others, in our own ordinary experience. So when we go to the doctor, the doctor, we tell them what we're experiencing, our, our condition, our elements, we, we say everything. And then the doctor explains to us what he thinks this is. And then he gives us some medicine. We have no idea about the medicine that he's prescribing to us. We can't say, you know what, that's not what I want, or this is not what I, we don't know, right? This man or woman went to school in the medical field they studied and they had that formal training. And then they received this authority to give us help, right? So they receive all these credentials to give us help. We don't know everything that they know. We don't have the knowledge that they have. So we have a natural faith in that doctor. And if we don't, I guess, agree with that doctor, we can go to another doctor and another doctor. But at some point, we we entrust ourselves to a physician, right? We have that kind of natural faith. And when we come to Christ, we know that his authority is the greatest. Yeah. And everything that he does, he does out of love for us. So when we have our faith in him, it can never be wrong. We can never be mistaken. You know, a doctor or a lawyer can be wrong. They're human, just like us. They can make mistakes, just like us, yeah. right? Yeah. There's limitations to that. But when we trust in Christ, there's no limitations. It's unlimited. Amen. When we go to confession, we acknowledge Christ's authority. And we turn to this divine physician to heal us of our wounds. Yeah. Because the Lord is a divine physician. Yeah. The church is a hospital. Come on. Right. Come on. Every time we come here, we allow the Lord to heal us of our wounds. Yes. And every one of us has wounds. Because we're in this battlefield against the devil, against yeah. the spirit of the world, yes. against our desire for sin. All these obstacles attack us. And we come here for healing. We come here to experience the healing of Christ because he has the authority to give us this healing. Yes. And we believe in his authority. Yes. Yes. So it's such a great gift. You know, we, we reveal our wounds in the sacrament of confession. We tell the Lord our wounds. And then he gives us consolation. He gives us encouragement. You know, in confession, I give you certain prayers to say as a form we call penance, right? And you say those prayers, or you do an act of charity to make reparation for the sin you committed, the sin I committed, right? You make those reparations by saying those prayers or doing an act of charity. And when we hear those words of absolution, when we say that we're sorry, we say the act of contrition, 
we become reconciled to the church. We become one with the church because of Christ. The precious blood of Christ on the cross at every confession, the Holy Spirit takes His precious blood and He pours it into our soul. He pours it into our heart because it is only through the blood of Christ yes. that we are healed. Yes. 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 That is the vaccine yes. for the virus of sin. That is the only vaccine. His precious blood yes. is the vaccine. You know, Our Lady is, I like to think of her as the nurse, you know, who guides us to trust our Lord, to not be afraid to go to confession, to not let our fears or our shame or our guilt to overcome us, to overcome our faith, to paralyze us, to not go to this great sacrament. You know, I went to confession just last week. I went to uh, St. John Newman Shrine, and I went there, and I talked to the, the receptionist, and I said, I want to go to confession. And the Redemptor's priest came down, and he heard my confession. No one in the world, no one in the world can tell me that Christ is not present in the sacrament confession. Come on. Amen. Come on. Yes, yes. Our Lord himself revealed this to each and every one of us. He reveals himself to us, just as he did to Peter. And the gospel we heard that our Lord said the question. He said, what did he say? Who do they say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Another passage, another gospel, you know, what is the survey? What's the census? Oh, they say that you're a prophet. You're this or that prophet. Everyone says something that's different. And then our Lord turns to his disciples, his apostles. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter was the only one who got up and he said, you are the Christ. Yeah. You are the Son of God. Why did Peter, of all the apostles, why did he get it right? Was it because he was holier than the other apostles? No, not really. Our Lord called him rock when he made this statement of faith, the profession of faith. But what did he say before? Another passage. When our Lord said, I'm going to Calvary, and Peter said, wait a minute, you know what? Time out, Lord. What, what are you talking about? What do you mean you want to go to suffer and die on the cross? No, 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 you, gotta, you, you can't do that, Lord. No, no, that's, that's wrong. You got it all wrong. You got you to gotta do this. Our Lord turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. That's pretty harsh, right? You're, when, you, someone call, when our Lord himself calls you Satan, you may think to yourself, like, well, I guess it's the end. Where am I going to go? Our Lord called Peter Satan because what he was saying was going against God's will. Come on, come on. Our Lord didn't sugarcoat it. He told him the truth. He, he said, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking as man thinks. What does we think? When we think about suffering or death, we avoid that at all costs. Why? Because we're human. We want to have life. We see suffering and death as evil. We see it as the greatest evil. Suffering and death. Got to avoid it at all costs. Right? That's how we think. Self-preservation. Even animals think that. Right? But what our Lord was saying this. When Peter was trying to tell our Lord what to do, he's saying, look, you don't tell me. You don't have the authority to tell me what to do. I tell you what to do. I'm giving you the pathway into heaven. I'm writing the map down. I'll give you a story. I was a little boy, and he wanted to play with his dad. He was very, very anxious, and he was waiting for his dad to come home. His mom was cooking, and she didn't have any time for him to play. So his dad come into the house, and he, he sees his son, and he's begging his dad to play with him. He said, come on, let's play. And his dad is tired. He said, look, I don't have time for this. I was working all day. I just need a nap. 
just give me 15 minutes and I'll play with you. But his little son was too anxious. He kept bothering him and angsting him. And so finally he said, okay, he took a, a magazine, he ripped out the page, and it was an image of a map, a very detailed map. He ripped in several pieces, and then he gave it to his son. He said, look, this is a puzzle. Figure out putting all this together, and once you figure that out and you paste it together, then I'm gonna play with you. Five minutes later, the, the son came with the map, and he was shocked. How did this little boy figure out putting it together in this map in five minutes. The other side of the page was an image of Santa Claus. <laughs> Why do I bring up this story? Well, Peter, the other apostles, us, we don't know what heaven is like. We've never been there. Heaven is not where we came from, right? We came from the earth. God took the earth, he breathed life into Adam and Eve, and he gave us Adam and Eve, right? He gave humanity life. We don't know what heaven is like. None of us were in heaven, right? Jesus is God. We profess that he is the son of God. His home is heaven. Yes. He came down from heaven to reveal to us the map. How do we get to heaven? He's already in heaven, he came down from heaven. All right, how do we get to heaven, Lord? What do we do? He explained it to Peter. He said, first, you gotta know who I am. Come on. If you don't know who I am, you're not gonna believe me. Come on. You're not gonna trust me. Everything I say, you're gonna say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I might do that. You're gonna pick and choose, right? You're gonna treat him like maybe a doctor or a lawyer, or a mechanic. You're not gonna give him the fullness of authority. You're gonna hold back. Something is gonna be holding, you're gonna hold something back. So our Lord said, first the foundation is, you have to understand who I am. That he is the Son of God. Yeah. So when Peter got up, the Holy Spirit gave him light. He gave him light, not because he was holy, not because he was smarter or better than anyone else, but because the Holy Spirit gave him light. The Holy Spirit gave me light. The Holy Spirit gave each and every one of you, he gave you light Amen. to realize that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Once we realize that he's Lord, then we say, okay, Lord, you are the Son of God. After that, he says, follow me. He said, follow me. And where do we go when we follow him? We go to Calvary, the cross. We go to be crucified with our Lord. He helps us to carry our cross because every one of us has a cross, right? You all have a cross to carry. Maybe it's your finance. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your relationship with your spouse or a family member. Maybe is your experience as a citizen here in this country. Maybe it's a, a, a political you know, a, a, a official, a government official. We all have different crosses that cause us great suffering, right? We all have a cross to carry. But the beauty of our faith is this that every time we come here together as brothers and sisters of Christ, we come to allow Christ to help us carry that cross. Yes. Because he is the Son of God. Yes, he, is. he is the Messiah. Yes, thank you. So that cross that is a burden for us, it becomes like a kite. You know, when you look at a kite, you see the cross beams, right? You see the cross, the cross things. But when a kite, the only way a kite can rise into the sky is the wind has to lift it up, Come on. right? The wind lifts up the kite. It has to cross things, but the wind lifts it up. So we have that cross, but the Holy Spirit gives us, he breathes into us through our faith. He empowers us, he lifts us up high. 
He lifts us up high so that we bear witness to Christ. We bear witness to Christ as the eternal Son of God. We bear witness to becoming the church. We as a family. This building is not the church. This building is not the church. Even if we had, even if the government took our churches and we were here outside in the field with a tent, we gathered together at an altar, we still are the church. Yeah. 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 We still give glory to God. God is glorified by our faith. Each and every one of you are a pillar of the church. And when we gather together with Christ in the Holy Eucharist, I represent Christ the head, and you represent his body. But every single member of his body is necessary. You know, St. Therese, who was a Carmelite nun, she said, I want to be a missionary. I want to go to different countries and evangelize and baptize and do everything to bring people into the church. But she was a nun in a monastery. She had no opportunity to go out and preach the gospel. Yet she had this burning desire to proclaim Christ as the Son of God. And she looked at the scripture and said, what do I do, Lord? What do I do? And she heard St. Paul said that everyone has a specific role in the body of the church. Everyone is not the head. Everyone is not the hands and the feet. And she said, I'm going to be the heart. I want to be the heart of Christ. And so she said, I want to pray for everyone who preaches the gospel, everyone who is evangelizing in the world. I want to pray and offer up penance to do sacrifice, to empower them, to experience God's grace in their ministry. So we all have a specific role in the body of Christ, and every member is needed. You know, what, what body would look normal without having a heart? or having hands, or having arms or hands. It would have had the fullness, right? The fullness would have every aspect of the body. And so we as a church, we gather together to profess our faith through the creed. In the same creed, we profess that faith, that we believe that we are part of the church. And there's three churches. The church in heaven we call the triumphant church. All our brothers and sisters in Christ, our family members who have gone to heaven, they are in the triumphant church. We are the militant church because we're in the battle. We're still fighting for souls or fighting for ourselves. You are courageous by coming to church. And when you bear witness to Christ, when you make the sign of the cross, you are courageous. Because the world doesn't want you to profess Christ. Because just as they hate Christ, they hate us, right? Just as they persecute Christ, they persecute us. Our Lord is truly God. Because what man or what human being would promise? He would promise you suffering. He would promise you a cross and, accept you to ex and expect you to accept it. But he said, not without his grace and a reward in the kingdom of heaven. And so the church in purgatory is called the suffering church. So our brothers and sisters of Christ who didn't make it straight to heaven, these souls in purgatory, they're praying for us. You know what I love to do? I love to ask our brothers and sisters, not only in heaven to pray for me, to pray for us, but I ask the souls in purgatory to pray for us. Because those souls are in purgatory they're holy. All of them are guaranteed heaven. And they're being purified. They're praying for us. They can't pray for themselves. They only can pray for us. So the souls in purgatory, they pray for us and they suffer. Their souls being purified. They experience the love of God, which is so beautiful, so intense, that it purifies their sin. But by that attachment to sin, that love for sin, it feels painful for them. It feels intense pain while they're praying because they're being cleansed of every drop of sin. Because not one 
taint of sin can be in heaven. Our soul has to be perfect. And so the Lord gives us hope because we gather together every Sunday to allow the Lord to purify our hearts, to purify our faith, so that we echo as Peter did. Jesus, we know who you are. You are Lord. You are the Son of God. 